I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. When most Canadians think of Canada's darkest moments, they will often think residential schools. It began in 1876 when Canada opened its first of these schools. Put in place by the British Canadian government, they were an attempt at turning Native American children into clean English speaking British Canadian citizens. This was done in many cases by forcefully taking these young children away from their parents and placing them into schools where any and all native traditions and beliefs were taken out of these children. Students were away from parents, isolated, stripped of cultural identity and were even forbidden to speak their native language. In almost all cases, these schools were housed inside of churches, three-fifths of which were Roman Catholic churches, where incredible amounts of rape, beatings and other forms of abuse took place. Death tolls were so high among these children that nearly 6% of those who entered schools passed away. Elders of Brandon, Manitoba tell of a shocking story that took place at the top of a nearby hill. At the top of this hill was a church which, like many, was a home to a residential school. Screams of terror and agony from young children are said to have been heard by many throughout the city on a daily basis. Despite this, these stories and facts were pushed under the rug and were found only at the back of Canadian history textbooks for decades. In total, an estimated 150,000 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children attended these residential schools. As shocking as it is, the last residential residential school was only closed as recently as 1996. It wasn't until 2008 that the then Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, on behalf of the Government of Canada, offered a formal apology to those placed in the Aboriginal residential schooling system. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. While the demand for seal fur and skin has all but crumbled throughout most of the world, with 34 countries putting a ban on seal importation, Canada has continued to hold on to the seal trade aggressively. A staggering 300 to 500,000 seals are legally allowed to be killed in Canada every year. In 2015, the government approved a quota for killing over 468,000 seals. What all this adds up to is it being the largest marine animal kill on the planet. The worst part, however, is the way that these seals are killed. In order to avoid any damage to the seal's pelt, they are killed using a hackapick, essentially a club with a metal spike at the end. It is illegal to kill a baby seal that still has its furry white color. However, it changes color in a process that takes just 12 days, after which it is completely legal to smash a 12 day old baby seal's skull, killing it. Once dead, they are then skinned but they aren't always dead. In fact, almost half the time they are still alive. In 2001, a team of veterinarians found that a staggering 42% of seals were still alive as they were being skinned. In 2011, 80% of all born seals in Canada died, and most were killed in this annual hunt. One argument is that the indigenous people of this area rely on this seal hunt as a means of living. However, another study has found that in actuality only about 3% of the seals killed are killed by the indigenous people. As well, of those 3%, most were actually adult seals. A large contrast when we see that an estimated 95-98% to 98 of seals killed during this commercial hunt are just 3 weeks to 3 months old. At this point, many have never even had a solid meal. In 
1885, a proposal for a system of segregation between whites and First Nations was signed by Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald. This was a shocking proposal that forced new rules onto reserves and Native Americans who lived on those reserves. It meant people were not allowed to leave their reserve unless they had a specific pass from a special Indian agent. The government of Canada knew that this had no basis in law, yet for over six decades, this illegal proposal went on. It applied to all Native Americans living within Canada. Any Native American caught outside of their reserve without a pass was immediately arrested and often sent to prison. In order to even visit family members in nearby reserves, they had to get approval and a permit from these agents. Now clearly there was a purpose in all of this, and it was to hold control over the Aboriginal people as well as stopping them from entering towns and cities populated mainly by whites. This segregated the two cultures from each other at the expense of Native American freedom. The government didn't want their white citizens being impacted and disturbed by Native Americans. In an attempt to hide this dark part of Canada's history, the Canadian government ordered all passes that they had handed out to be returned to Ottawa for destruction in 1941. Today, the very lasting effects of this can still be seen all over Canada as a striking cultural divide between Native Americans from the rest of society still remains. African American slavery in the United States undoubtedly left a truly dark patch on American history. We all know of the Underground Railway that saw many black slaves fleeing their owners in an attempt at freedom in Canada. This is where the history of slavery and Canada often comes to an end. However, while Canada likes to be portrayed as having been a safe haven for American slaves, Canada has its own dark history of slavery. Throughout the 1700s, Canadians from all walks of life owned slaves. From military officers to blacksmiths to even priests. Owning a slave was a status symbol that many sought after, so much so that many actually went into severe debt just to own one. Slaves were advertised in paper ads and were sold in slave auctions and handed down just as possessions and farm animals were. While many slaves at the time were Native Americans, two thirds to be exact, black slaves were twice as expensive and were seen as the best of the best. Of all slaves owned, over 80% were owned only by the French living in Lower Canada, or known today as Quebec. Thus, it makes sense that the last slave auction was held in Quebec in 1797, and by 1833, slavery as a whole was finally abolished. About the same time that the Underground Railway was beginning to form. After the attacks of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the Western world was shaken. The following year of 1942 would see horrible conditions for the Japanese people of Canada. The fear of a Japanese invasion grew among Canadians, and Canada as such began removing all people of Japanese descent from their homes, their jobs, and sent them to camps. Police went door to door in all hours of the day kicking down doors and ordering Japanese Canadians, innocent of any crime, to take as much as they could carry, loaded them on trucks and trains built for cattle, and then sent them to camps. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But this wasn't Nazi Germany, this was the Canadian police, this was Canada. On February 24th, Prime Minister William L. Mackenzie King issued orders to evacuate all people of Japanese origin to these camps and any possessions that they were not able to carry were immediately taken into custody. This land and property was later liquidated. These camps had no running water or electricity and were extremely overcrowded. 
In the end, nearly 21,000 Japanese people were taken, almost all of which had been living in Canada for 25 to 40 years, 13,000 of which were born Canadian citizens. On May 2nd, 1947, almost 4,000 Japanese Canadians were sent back to Japan. Eventually, these controls over the Japanese people were lifted on March 31st, 1949, when Japanese were finally allowed to vote. It wasn't until this time that the Canadian population began to open up to the Japanese.